Hey everybody, Brian Zane here, joined by Jay Biggs and Jay. We just watched AEW Revolution. Had to get that one last time in. Like a Justin Roberts. <laughs> Justin Roberts was on point tonight. He had a lot of all throughout the night. He was on Justin Roberts' point. <laughs> the ending of it, I can't wait to talk about it with you because it was the highest of highs and lowest of lows in the span of mere moments. MJF and Chris Jericho challenging the Young Bucks. First of all, I really like the screens on the floor for uh, the entrances for the yeah, show. a little touch for the pay-per-views. Oh, I had to say, there were some times where I'm like, if I was walking on that floor, I'd be dizzy as hell. Like, seeing Matt right. Hardy's entrance with the dollar oh, bills yeah. going by, like, I would have just fallen over. You've got uh, <laughs> great heel work by MJF and Jericho. Mm -hmm. They're doing the stalling suplex with the double deuce. It's hard to compare to last year's Revolution match the Bucks were in with Omega and Page. It's not the same match. I knew it wasn't no. going to be the same match, but I think that, uh, I think it was, I think that it was uh, J MJF and Jericho did a pretty good job kind of matching up or kind of working up to their the Young Bucks speed and the Bucks also you could tell had a had kind of compromise as well. Right, they did. But you know what? I, th I think everything worked out well. They kept MJF <clears throat> strong because he didn't get the, the L. Um, Jericho yeah. did the job for the Bucks. I yeah. think, you know, I took the Meltzer driver. Yeah, well, he took the, yeah. after, the, after the BTE trigger and MJF saved the pin, I was surprised Jericho took that pinfall. But let's talk about some other things about the match as well, like Tony Schiavone being so anti-MJF on commentary. Like, uh, yeah. Right. Uh, I mean, he wanted to see uh, a lot of bad things happen to sub him. Subjective even for him, I would say, and biased. I felt bad for JR, because he was already losing his voice oh, as no. the show he began. He sounded like Fred Sanford at the beginning of the show. <laughs> You've got, I think it was Nick who went for the flip, and like, I don't know if he went short or Jericho didn't like cover the distance, but <laughs> he just yeah. falls on his ass, like, oh, I Boom. guess I'll, I'll, set, I'll set myself up for the walls of Jericho now. What would you rate this match? We're doing the five-star gimmick nowadays. Five-star gimmick, uh, three. Three, I would say three and a half is where I'm gonna go with this one. Yeah, it was not the Bucks' best performance, and I think that again, it was kind of like it's their styles, their style with MJF and Jericho. It's not the same thing. You're not gonna get the same kind of electricity, even with the character work of Jericho and MJF, of which was very good. Well, you can't say that the tag team division in AEW is dead because not only did you right. open the show with a tag title match, you've got a whole bunch of other teams thrown into the mix here for the Casino Tag Team Battle Royal. And there's a lot of teams in this one. A lot, of, a lot, of, a whole lot of nothing is the first part of this matchup, where the people, the bodies kind of pile up before right. things really begin to break down. You have Natural Nightmares and Five and Ten up first. Santana and Ortiz are up next. They last a pretty long while. The Seidel brothers, uh, Grayson and Evil Uno, right. uh, Austin and Colt Gun, who has some great elevation, by the way. I mean, it was weird because I think that the Gun brothers had so little time to do stuff, and everything they did was like call back to Billy Gun, call back to right. Billy Gun. And I think it's like, yeah, I hope that can move on after a certain point where they just don't do all their all their dad's offense. Like, you know, the famous. I like, their, great. I like their looks. Colt's drop kick was amazing. Yeah. The elevation he had on that was superb. Um, the one headband <clears throat> is the Chuck and Billy headband. The other headband is like the badass Billy Gunn. Yeah, headband, that was you know, kind of cool. It's like it was a nice tribute to Billy Gunn. Oh, yeah. But at some point those two got to do their own thing. That's my take on it. There's some bit of a, a storyline brewing here with QT Marshall. Like, he eliminates the guns, who's part and of the Nightmare family. Marshall. Marshall, is that his thing now? So he eliminates the guns. He spits in Dustin's face and eliminates himself. Uh, it seems to be, like, what was brewing for the last couple weeks about he's unappreciated, it seems. One thing I noticed when uh, Lee Johnson won the match a couple weeks ago on Dynamite, he thanked everyone in the Nightmare family but QT, and there was a visible, like, hmm, some side, yeah, some side eye from that. So this seems to be brewing toward that. That was one of the bigger storylines I then, think we saw in this matchup. Well, with him just walking out on, uh, you know, Dustin Rhodes, you know, it's like, what the heck? We started to notice, oh, all the eliminations are on one side of the Yeah, room. it is just one. It's that funny, was so hard weird. cam side. That was so weird. Like, you know, I mean, you, I get working north-south because that's where the hard cam is, but they didn't even explore the other side. But my favorite part of this matchup, though, is when Marco Stunt runs in, hits Evil Uno with a Hurricane Rana, uh, and Uno yeah, has to just sp jumps him sprint. And sprint. He has to sprint from the middle of the ring all the way to the corner and take a header in there. It was the Funniest thing I've ever seen. In the end, we're down to SCU, the Silver and Reynolds combination of the Dark Order, the Death Triangle, and Jungle Boy, and it works down to its two-on-one Death Triangle and Jungle Boy, but Jungle Jack is able to eliminate Pack, and it's down to those two. They have some great offense. Yeah. Just like some of the most athletic stuff you'll see all night. There is a bit of a confusion, though, because Phoenix at one point dives to the outside, and like 
The referee thinks he eliminated himself. Yeah, but it's just through the middle ropes. Yeah. Then Phoenix clotheslines Jungle Boy out to win. And so, yeah, he and Pac are going to be facing the Young Bucks at some point in the future. That match is going to be dope. That's going to be the opposite of what Jericho and MJF was. Right. In, like, every respect. And I am really looking forward to seeing that match play out. But, Biggs, what was your rating for the Tag Team Battle Royal? Three and a half stars out of five. Okay. I didn't actually mind it that bad. I would say for, it was a three for me. Because, you know, I think like I think a, a good battle royal has got a great combination of, like, fun eliminations, fun participants, and some storyline thrown in. I think we got very... Unless we're seeing things that are going to begin here and move on to Dynamite Futures, future shows, that I think you, only having the QT Marshall thing happening... I'm trying to think what other kind of big stories we really saw... Well, happen in this, they this, made this Bear movie. Country look like a million dollars, but then they had the Butcher eliminate them, and then like five had, seconds later, the Butcher is eliminated. You had Stu like, picking up one member of Bear Country, like right. you know, practically deadlifted, and it was crazy. Um, yeah, I think it was. Yeah, it was okay. Battle Royal. It was fun at the end. The finish itself was great, um, but I think that yeah, everything leading to the match itself, it was just you know, it was it was a battle royal, and there's always so much you can really do. To like tell a story or have it, have it like hit, hit all those points. The women's title match up next is Hikaru Shida defense against Ryo Mizunami, who won the Eliminator Tournament last week on Dynamite. They did a great job kind of filling in the blanks on the hype package before this match, I think. Right, they did. Yeah, explaining some of their history, and they've been wrestling for years at this point. And Rio even said, you know, in 100 years, you've never beat me. So I kind of like that. We couldn't see the first part of the match. My internet crapped out as the match began, and, like, I couldn't get back to, like, that point, like, the first part of it. So, right. But we get we get to the point where we, we, we resume with the point where Rio is getting her heat on uh, Hikaru early on. Makes her big comeback. They fight on the outside. Uh, dropping her head first on the stage, and this smile on her face of Sheeta kind of, like, getting one up on her. Right. was a nice bit of character moment there. I really appreciated that. Rio strong styles out of the first Tamashi. She just goes, Brr, you know, uh, presses, what was it, an X for comeback or something. There's a call back to the moment after the uh, tournament finals last week where they shake hands and they're mm -hmm. trading forearms and stuff. We got more of that in this matchup. Uh, she had a kicks out of the guillotine leg drop, which was the move that Rio's been using to advance and win these right, matches. Right, I thought that was going to be it. It's very psychosis-like. Yeah, I mean, by the end, these two were kicking out a lot of each other's things, like Tamashi's the guillotine leg drop, all these big things. It was getting almost kind of ridiculous after. It was, like a, it was like a young does match, not young bucks, but a young does. I don't know. Yeah, no. A lot it, of kicked outs. It was yeah. a lot of kick outs and a lot of big moves, and there's the occasional like, I'm going to power through this move and right. hit which will move back. Uh, ultimately, corkscrew knee attack, which you, I think we, you, you kind of accurately point out, felt like a, it was kind of a uh, trouble in paradise. But with a knee, with instead, a knee of the foot. instead of the foot. Yeah. yeah, thought that was kind of a cool. Uh, yeah, movie. very innovative. I like. And it. so Shida wins and retains. Uh, I give it four stars out of five. It did get kind of exhausting by the end, but it was. I definitely think one of the most physically intense matches. And I love these two just kind of going at it and really, yeah, I think they, they left it all out there and I had a fun time watching the match. What did you think? I thought the match was good, so I'll give four out of five too. But then after the match, Nyla Rose jumping Sheeta and then Britt Baker, Rebel, and Maki Ito is making her, her, her uh, on-air U.S. appearance, her debut here in this matchup. Uh, they do a beatdown. And uh, oh, also I think it was great. Thunder Rosa, the only woman in this entire right. segment who not did not red wear red. Yeah, not wear red, and she just totally stood out. Heels and faces Smart. didn't matter. They're all wearing red tonight. I love that uh, Maki Ito uh, is now rolling with Brit and Rebel now. Uh, I, I, it's like I've not seen a lot of her work, but I've liked what I've seen, and I love this whole. She's kind of this like someone who really kind of subverts the pop idol. Uh, trope in, in Japan. Right, right. I, and, and you know, that's my first exposure to her. Uh -huh. So I was like, what's this all about? And you were trying to explain it to me. I just think that's a, I don't know, it's a very cool looking outfit. Yeah, Queen of the Simps. So. She's in AEW now and like, I, I think we can get some good mileage out of, you know, you've seen some of the Joshi wrestlers show up, like there's Rio here, uh, Maki Ito, he's here now in Florida apparently, and like, maybe we'll get a couple matches out of them on Dynamite or Dark. Very excited for that to get more exposure to those ladies. Right. But yeah, I think it was uh, yeah, let's give the Queen of the Simps that screen time, man, because I think there was a big disappointment when she lost the first round of the tournament. Right. <laughs> but now she's back with a vengeance. Miro and Kip Sabian versus Chuck Taylor and Orange Cassidy. This one gets kind of off the rails right off the bat because there's a backstage interview with Orange and Chuck, but Miro and Kip jump them. Miro right. throws Chuck through the glass. 
and then he drags him out and uh, kind of a badass play my music and right before the entrance and everything. Um, yeah, and the story is is Chuck gets the hell beat out of him on orange to sell in the back. Uh, then there's the hope spot. Orange shows back up, gets the hot tag into House of Fire. Vicious. Power. I I do like it. Yeah, I, every everything in, in, in the beginning of this match was actually pretty cool, especially the the Orange Cassidy doing the kicks to the to Miro. Mm -hmm. You know, because you're sitting there going, oh, what the heck's going to happen next? But, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, yeah. But, you know, it's funny. It's like, I think, you know, Miro looked strong the whole match, and it was those kicks that, like, kicked him into a whole new gear, so to speak, because that's when he went on his, like, basically a hot tag to himself, where he's just like, I'm going like, to destroy everything. Yeah, he's like, you think I'm going to deal with this shit? <laughs> he throws <laughs> Orange into Penelope Ford. Yeah, and, and, and obviously that was done to set up something, some sort of a... Uh, I, I think it shows like, that his lack of caring about it kind of made it seem like even Kip can't control him. Like, he doesn't even care about Kip's wife. What is... You know, there's his best friends, and, like, he's, like, he's just on this war path. Tell me they're not. They didn't bring Miro... Rusev, yeah, <laughs> so that they can eventually have him feud with a, a babyface Kip Sabian. Do you really believe that that is like? I mean, because that seems like the only place for this. Well, to I go. I doubt that it would be a lengthy feud. I think Miriam would probably just beat up Kip once and kind of call it call it right. Good. But God, it just seems like so much they could be doing with this guy. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's like you know, I said in my predictions video. Like, I think everyone needs to distance themselves from this angle, and I think inc that includes. Kip and Miro. They need to split. I think Miro needs to, you know, find his wings and fly, you know? Right. He needs to, he needs to leave the nest and he needs to be his own best man. Uh, in other words, Tony Khan needs to get his fucking money worth. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Get his money's worth on Miro. But anyway, you got Miro with the game over to win on Chuck. And uh, yeah, I mean, the match itself, I will give it three stars. I think it was a good story and... Um, I think everything looks fine, but yeah, not not it was it's somewhere kind of in the middle of the show. Uh, we didn't mention how Orange Cassidy when he made his comeback, he looked like Roddy Piper at WrestleMania 12. Yeah, he, he, he you had the Piper <laughs> Mania 12 vibes with him. Um, yeah, I can see some of that for sure. I think this is kind of a good match to put him in that trajectory of like now he's kind of being untethered. He, you know, it's like we'll see what happens as this goes on, how this relationship with he and Kip will surely eventually disintegrate. You would think. Yeah, yeah I. I'd give it a probably a three out of five. Yeah. Backstage, MJF blatantly telegraphing he's going to betray Chris Jericho tonight. What did you think of them announcing the Inner Circle War Council for Wednesday? Uh, I don't know. I I, I I didn't think too much of it, honestly. <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm, I'm just. <laughs> I I think it's almost become kind of a bit of parody, and I wonder if this will be acknowledged. Where it's like I feel everything the Inner Circle does has got to be some big hoopla to it, like. There's the press conference, there's the debate, there's the war council, there's right. the summit, there's the this, there's the that. Like, <laughs> I get, you know, it's, it's part of Jericho's shtick to be kind of like having a panache right. for showmanship and hyperbole. He's trying to win another Emmy or something. Maybe you know? MJF will point that out when he does inevitably say, it's time for a change and I'm going to Rocky Maya via you out of this group. Farouk <laughs> to take over the right, circle. Right, right. When is Jericho going to get that signed picture of MJF as a present? <laughs> so we go to our next match, the big money match, as Hangman Page takes on Matt Hardy. I love that Page is now so closely associated with beer. His entrance video is literally beer. Right. It's horses and beer. How this man's not the top guy, top baby face in the company, I have no so, idea. So now, so now that, that Brody, you know, has passed away, is he is he going to basically be the leader? Dark order. Well, we'll talk about that on. after this match because I, I think that's worth discussing. This is good back and forth in this matchup here. I mean, uh, I think Matt did a great job working with Paige, and Paige with some great spots coming back, like the big moonsault yeah. and the dive on the inside. I mean, this has worked just a, a great uh, competitive match. And yeah, I thought that they told a good story. Um, I love the finish. Yeah, the finish was great because you've got Private Party coming in near the end and distracting. Hardy tries to capitalize, but it doesn't pay off. Then the Dark Order all show oh, up. Right. They beat up Private Party. It's a mugging. These all, They are seriously outnumbering Private Party. You almost feel bad for those guys. <laughs> <laughs> and then they save Paige from a falling. It's the Adam Rose Trust Fall. Right. It was the Adam Rose Trust Fall. Uh oh, uh oh, oh. Whoa. Oh. But he gets the buckshot onto Matt. Oh. Oh, to win the match, and he's got he's <clears throat> he's got Matt Hardy's money and the Dark Order's love, and they toast at the end. What do you think Paige is gonna do with that money now? Buy a bunch of beer. 
I think he's going to legally adopt all the members of the Dark Order oh, and just be, his, be their legal father. Oh my gosh, no. <laughs> I just want to see him take, you know, John Silver and Alex Reynolds to fucking Universal Studios and just, like, have fun. Just, he makes them all ranch hens. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it's like, I want to see him, like, start the Dark Order Orphanage or something. Oh, for the Dark Orphanage. <laughs> <laughs> I want to give this four stars. I feel like I'm overrating it almost. I think if I watch it back later on, I might not have the same sense of euphoria from it but like watching the ending just made me really smile let me almost get out of my seat because i was so happy for the dark order saving the day what do you rate this match uh you know as far as as it being fun i i mean i'm at three and a half okay i think three and a half yeah i mean i think it's a totally good story too and the match it was just like it was a nice like it was a clean entertaining match there was no wasted motion and I think it got the job done and made Paige look really great. In your face, the Revolution ladder match, you have Cody Rhodes, Max Caster, Lance Archer, Penta El Zeto M, Scorpio Sky, and the sixth man. We'll get to that in a minute, but first I want to discuss the literal brass ring. The brass inner tube hanging above the ring. Right. I expected Sonic the Hedgehog to come out and grab it any second. It looked like one of those pillows that you use on the airplane and put it around your neck or something. It, it was know. like, it was really... the brass ring phrase is so, I feel commonly associated with like the the difficulty or the glass ceiling like in WWE for example it was a phrase that was like grab the brass ring right it was something that was made popular in that Vincent Mann interview and ever since then the brass ring has always been kind of used to describe wrestlers who were like on that cusp but for whatever reason they can't get it and like it's just another one of those just like in your face I, I almost think it's kind of a shot at WWE. I, I, I well, think everything that they, that Cody does or something is everything they do. Sort of, yeah, everything they do. So it's like that. I thought was a little, little on the nose. The brass ring, um, especially when you have the face of the revolution, which in, which implies kind of an anti-authority sort of thing, and the brass ring represents that authority. Also, let's talk about the fact that Jade Cargill is well, the first time I noticed her in the front row in this thing. She's on the poster of this pay-per-view. Right, thank you. Thank <laughs> you, yes. <laughs> One week you're having your sports center moment, teaming with Shaquille O'Neal uh -huh. in a halfway decent match on Dynamite. You're on the poster for the pay-per-view. Next week, you're in the front row. <laughs> like, they couldn't do anything with her? I'm, I couldn't believe that. I thought, and just my opinion, I don't know, maybe have her jump the rail and beat up Sheeta. And so Nyla yeah. Rose and have that same exact feud yeah. going on. I figured they would have maybe put her over like that or something. I but. thought that would have been a really good, a smart thing to do. You're actually you're absolutely right. I would have had Jade Cargill jump instead of, like, as fun as it was to see Maki Ito show up with Britt and, and Rebel... I think, yeah, have Jade show up and, like, get her heat back. Or, I mean, get, you know, or not even get something, back. Something. Not even get back because she won. the match happened. Max Caster gets the crowd alive in his opening rap, talking about Dr. Seuss and how uh, Andrew Cuomo has blood on his hands. Holy shit, he went there. Oh. And now let's introduce the sixth man, all ego, Ethan Page, uh, who's recently one of the longest reigning tag team champions in Impact. Part of the North, and uh, he, he his last match there was uh, Ethan Page versus the Karate Man, which he said was edited so poorly that's why he fucking quit. <laughs> right. But I'm very happy for him. I'm very glad to see him getting his shot in AEW because I've been seeing him in the Indies and everything, and like what he did in Impact. And um, yeah, I think it's a great shot for him to be in this matchup here. And so now we've seen three dudes tonight with the last name of Page. We saw DDP in the crowd earlier, Hangman Page, and now Ethan, Ethan Page. Page. Oh. And we're not done yet with some rhyming names, just a little tease there. One of my favorite spots tonight, Penta trying to sling blade the ladder onto Archer and it not looking great. Like he has to come down with it and then gently put the ladder on top oh, of it. Oh yes, 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 yes. There were some moments here where I felt Archer was like kind of out of place with the ladder. There was a moment where he's like... Oh, he's, he's just fell off the ladder like he just slumped off you know he, he didn't even he there's a one point where the ladder's kind of like leaning on the ropes and he's looking at it real close or giving it a real good inspection hmm let's look at the quality of this oh, ladder yeah. so he before can get a famouser gets, or yeah famous or whatever on the ladder he was like there for a long long time Ooh, how does this work canadian destroyer by penta onto cody is right. what gets him written off for a bit because cody's got the shoulder injury Cody's written off, he comes back, and he gets booed! They didn't want to see him come back! Jake Roberts comes in and does the short arm clothesline to Ethan Page, but then he gets super kicked, which is hilarious. And then, like, it just Jake seems selling the apron, just like, oh, I'm done for the night, I'm, 
I'm too fucking blown up. Jake totally fucking took that kick. I'm not bumping for that kick. You end with Cody and Scorpio Sky, who slams Cody's injured arm into the ladder, shoves him off, and grabs the brass ring, kid. And yeah, he wins. All right, I give this one four stars out of five, and I'm taking a little bit off because of Cody hitting the worst Cody cutter off oh, the yeah, ropes on the Penta, and they go like two different directions. <laughs> and, and even JR referenced. Like, that was the ugliest a... Cody cutter I've ever, ever seen. <laughs> I'm going to go with you, actually, Brian, and say four out of five. I, I think it was well executed. Everything, that this storyline needed to be done. This the surprise, the surprise of Ethan Page was pretty cool, I think. And, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, for people who aren't really familiar with his work, I think they can look at him. Again, again, Max Caster getting time to shine. Jake Roberts getting this shit in as well. It was pretty entertaining. So, yeah, that's uh, that four, four feels right for me. Well, after days of wild and rampant speculation, we found out who the mystery signing was, the one that Paul White foretold, and it was the instant classic Christian Cage... <sighs> Complete with countdown. I'm pretty sure he had the original TNA theme. I mean, I'm glad he's there, mm -hmm. honestly. But I mean, what? What? I'm just trying to figure out where they're gonna. Where are they gonna pencil him in? Yeah, I mean, I think that AEW is kind of like loaded with a lot of talent right now, and it's like hard to see where he's gonna play in the picture. I mean, I'm happy for him because you could see at the Rumble. First of all, let's talk about the timing because just no fewer no more than 30 days ago he was in the royal rumble match his right. first match back you know in a long time in the tights and everything the moment with him and edge ships passing the night edge comes back and, and christian's on his way to aew that was a pretty cool moment and um especially in hindsight now like thinking about that it makes it more special, I think. And then after that, he goes right to AEW with all this hype and being the next guy, you know, the next signee and stuff. Christian is a special case because he's someone who didn't get to end his career on his own terms, kind of like Edge. Right. He had like all these concussions; they held him back for a long time. He seems to be in good enough shape, and if he can wrestle and if he can be a viable asset to AEW, then I think it's fine. I think he should be allowed to do that. Oh, no, absolutely. I think he should. It's just a matter of what they're going to do with him. I have no clue. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that this is probably the best option for them as far as their surprise. I think they came through with it because, like, they were never going to get CM Punk or Lesnar or John Cena, you know? And, like, I'm, I'm glad it wasn't a swerve or a troll job where it's like Big Show comes out, I'm the, I'm the signee, ha ha ha. Or right. it's not somebody who's like another. Right. Another sports hall of fame. I heard Mark Henry. Yeah. And I, Kurt Angle. It's like, I mean, like, it, it wasn't any of the wild, fantastic ones. It wasn't a dud. It wasn't like a joke. And so I think that in that respect, AEW really needed to have a home run with this announcement. Because if they botched this or if they had some joke with it, they can never be taken seriously again. So I think that with Christian coming out, I think they made good on that. Do you think it was like worth the hype? Do you think that it was um, worthy of the buzz and the Hall of Fame caliber announcement? I'm just, I am baffled by AEW and the way they present things. Like the, like, you know, the big, uh, like Shaq's gonna wrestle, right? Well, let's not build it up right and put it on pay-per-view. Let's do this really weird kind of build. Uh, you know, the big show's coming, or Paul White is coming. They just announced on Twitter, and the next, like, week he just shows up. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know, like, they waited, like, and this was, a, to me, they should have almost had, like, Christian debut with, like, the, hey, we signed Christian, and he's coming out. And then the big show was, like, the big announcement. I don't well, know, maybe I, no, I'm wrong. See, I, I think that actually the way they did those two announcements was correct. I think, you know, like, yeah, having Paul White as a surprise announcement would have been fine, but if we're going to take... Paul White and Christian, and we give away one, and we make the other one a surprise or a mystery. Christian's the one you make the surprise or the mystery, I think. But I agree with you that the, the way they book celebrities in AEW, by and large, has not been great. Time now for the street fight. You got Taz, Team Taz, I should say, Cage and Starks versus Sting and Darby Allen. This is full on cinematic. Uh, the feeling of the live commentary doing. Uh, over a very, very cinematic and very edited, very stylistic match was right. very weird for me at first. Like, it's they're responding to it as if they're, it's like almost like, not MST3K, but it's that style where it's like, it just feels like... Like streamers or something? It's like, yeah, it's like two <laughs> different worlds. Like, where it's like the live kind of... One almost kind of subverts the other. But, you know, Taz joins up in commentary as Ricky Starks and Brian Cage roll up in their sweet green sports car. You get Sting in his Suburban and Darby skates down the hill. No, and no, no, Sting rolls up in like an S10, like a little short bed pickup. Yeah, it wasn't even a Suburban, yeah. 
Yeah, and then my best, my favorite part about this is like you see all the footage of them driving to the venue, and even Taz the important like, enough, hurry up already, get there. Right, 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 right. right. <laughs> we get the army of Stinger hoodlums that accompany Sting and Darby to the ring for this street fight. I loved the half twenty on two. The, That's the half Stinger, half Darby face paint for Sting. That was pretty cool. Um, as the match begins in the ring, at one point K just murders some of the hoodlums. Like just hurls a tire at one of them. Like that's a that was a shoot tire he threw at. <laughs> right, but what happened to those guys? Because there was like fifteen of them. Yeah. As soon as the match got you know to the outside of the ring, it was like three or four of them got beat up by Cage, and it was I think they, over. They got spooked. It was like oh shit, he just killed three of my brothers. I gotta get out of here. Dude, Darby <laughs> Allen's crew is a bunch of pussy. <laughs> Yeah, what sorry, about, what, I don't know. What about a flamethrower in that opening video? Where was the flamethrower there? That would have been really useful. Ah, my son's a skateboarder. I know that they're they're tough. I don't know if it's like kill the illusion or the immersion for me, but it was almost a bit too like, video gamey, where the tracking shot from like the ring down the long hallway to the other end, where like uh, where Cage and Darby were fighting. Oh, that was kind of interesting. Uh, Brian Cage with a stalling suplex. While he's going up the stairs, right, is one of the damnest things you will ever see. It's very impressive <laughs> in professional actually. wrestling. That is some um, that is some top tier big beefy man shit there. So it's a fight that goes across two floors and down this long hallway in this big empty looking warehouse and stuff. You've got powerhouse Hobbs and Hook running in. Uh, Hobbs coming in with a big orange mask. Like why? It's like. No shit. Like, who, who's he trying to fool? Who's this other jack right. dude who's beating me up? Darby is swung like, uh, what is it? What do you call it? Jump rope style into the window, and the window then falls on his head. Yeah, and it shoot like clunked him on the top, <laughs> God, too. It's so bad. Um, oh. Yeah, but he recovers, though, and he helps. Because earlier, Sting hurls his bat up into the upper deck. Because like Ricky challenges him and he calls you know he calls his bluff and they fight right and then Darby throws the bat back down and it's like bam bam Sting comes fighting him back uh, and the uh, then then Cage is on this platform and Darby with this flying elbow from the top down and oh, they no. fall into this bottomless pit down to Possibly. Sting and Starks in the ring is where it ends back up Scorpion Death Drop and Sting wins for his team um, damn I, I'm gonna give this one four and a half stars I really appreciate and enjoy this match as someone who en who can enjoy a good cinematic match uh, even though i know it's a it's a it's a polarizing topic i think this is about as good as you can get for one I, even though the medium has been played out last year i think they did a really good job with this cinematic match i think they did a really good job with the cinematography yes. but i do believe they should have been more on top of it with the music being more dramatic and not having Taz in the background going, what is this shit? I almost you think know, that the like, music was too much. Like, I think that it's like the commentary I got used to over time, but the music almost killed it for me. And I don't think they needed that. But I will agree that it was shot beautifully, lit really well. You could see everything. Um, yeah, I think and then they, they didn't rely on special effects. There were a couple of jump cuts. There was one near the end where Stanley like, did this almost like a big jump cut. We're staying trying to do like a roll up and we'll see if he fucked it up. I don't know. Just a big, big cut there. But um, besides that, it was pretty fluid feeling. And yeah, I think it was a big brawl. It didn't get like supernatural and spooky and stuff. Right. There wasn't a whole lot teleportation of teleportation or Yeah, anything. no teleportation. It was just a big brawl. And um, there was a bit of like hoopla at the beginning. But I think it was, yeah, it was just really well done, really well constructed cinematic match. So yeah, four and a half stars is my rating. What about you? Uh, I, about four and a half, yeah. Actually, pretty damn good. It's time for the main event, the exploding barbed wire death match. It's Kenny Omega defends the AEW title against Jonathan Moxleyton. Moxley with the Onita-inspired jacket for his entrance. I thought that was that. pretty cool. Um, a couple things we noticed early on. It's just, it wasn't like the ropes are replaced by barbed wire. They're wrapped in barbed wire. Right. Also, only one side of the ring is like, has, there's no barbed wire they can hit the ropes on. At least they give him something to work with. I think, right. if, I think if Omega couldn't hit the ropes at all in this match, like he would have be been screwed. He would have been way more handcuffed. I liked how they built the drama of them like teasing the barbed wire moments and then like the the first time we get it is like i think they wait seven or eight minutes to get the first explosion it, it, it kind of comes out they of nowhere. did really <clears throat> good though they did really really good about staying off the ropes in the beginning i was whenever i mentioned that their sequence was i mean it was right on par moxley's bleeding after being thrown into a trash can already bleeding a lot in this thing uh moxley then makes his comeback because moxley's thrown into the ropes twice 
He throws Omega into the ropes twice back, once out of the figure four, and then again with the drop kick. And uh, they're on the apron, and then they uh, go do a paradigm shift off one of the triple hells. It's the only time we get a triple hell side thing happening. There's three sides that only right. do the spot on one of them, which I thought was interesting. They didn't explore like two out of the three. But that took him a while. That took him out. Omega bled from that as well. He was pretty ugly bleeding after that. I think the most brilliant part of this match was when Kenny hits the one-winged angel, and Moxie has to kick the rope, and that blinds, right, and blinds Omega. Him. That's awesome. That was pretty damn clever. Yeah. I loved that to death. That that was amazing. Uh, the Good Brothers run in. Omega gets some help. He has an exploding barbed wire bat to Moxley's face. Uh, but he kicks out of it because, you know what? As uh, devastating as a bat is uh, that explodes in your face, there's no TV blowing up in your face. Am I right? right? Yeah. We all know they're way more devastating. And that's why and that's why Ambrose lost to an exploding television and not to an exploding bat. So we get an, a one-winged angel on, the, on a chair, and that's what puts him away. And that's like... Boy, if you don't make Mossy look strong after that, or if he doesn't look strong after that, then something's wrong. Which he... was about, and, and mind you, this was about six minutes before the, the before the explosion. Because I wasn't happen. aware that like the timer still goes like once it's over. Because they say after thirty minutes, the ring, uh, the ring, everything detonates. It's like a self destruction. You, you, you are now stuck in the arena. Self destruction. I assume. I assume the timer was gonna just stop. You know, once the match was over, it's like you've defused the bomb, but no, and they have to kill all this time and just beat the bejesus out of Mox and they handcuff him. I felt they could have shaved. Like, I feel they went kind of light. Or they could have lied and just like cut that beat down a little bit and so you've got like, and then we go to the count a little bit early. You know? <laughs> who, who was really going to fact check that? So then Eddie Kingston comes out. Moxley's helpless in there. He runs in there. You know, he's he got to... tries to wake him up. He's got to save his former brother. He says, yes, yeah. he, he, he has a heart after all. That was really cool. He had all the time in the world to actually pull him out and get him out of the ring. <laughs> Which I thought was hilarious. Like, dude... He's like, just He's roll trying, him. Right. Just roll him. He's like, Come on, John. Wait but no, he covers him, and like King of the Death Match 95, you get the weakest, the worst, oh, the man. goddamn worst explosion I've ever seen in it my life. Literally, I was trying to decipher. It looked like the opening five seconds of like a WCW Nitro mm -hmm. or a Diesel 95 entrance. <laughs> it was so You know, so I'm weak. trying to figure out. The explosions were like sparklers and then a little... <laughs> Dude, Gilbert made more of a sparkle. Gilbert had better pyro than yes. this. And Kingston had to sell it. He had to sell it like he was dead. I felt so bad for him. Like... Oh my god. That like undid everything we had up until this point. They're gonna have to do when they put it in post production and show the highlights. This can't be his fault though. They're gonna have to wrestling society access. They have to add a bunch of shaky cam. They gotta add eight more explosions, because there's no way they can replay that clip in good faith and say, here's what knocked John Moxley out for several it's months. It's not Moxley, it's not Kingston's fault. It's no. it's it's Callus's fault, if anything, because remember him and Omega were they planning built... this in the La Quinta. Yeah. They were they were I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> At the, <laughs> the little table in there, they were building this thing for many weeks. Or they whatever. built the triple hell. They yes, built all that stuff. They designed it. If anything, Omega fucked up more than anything. He could not get the job done. They should have hired professionals to do this. I was down for this match. I think everything up to that point, I would have given it maybe three and a half stars because there's only so much you could do with it. I think what they, they explored the space well enough, but it could have been better. But then, yeah, that explosion. If you lump that in with the thing, I bring it down to fucking one star. <laughs> it was so bad. It ruined everything. It ruined everything they did. Yeah, it did, <laughs> dude. I mean, and I and I hate to do it here. I'm going to have to channel it because as much as you look like him. <laughs> yeah, you're, I know. Your illegitimate see, father. See, you're the Cornette fan of the, between the two of us here. So I you am. gotta tell me, you listen to the podcast. You gotta channel the old man. I am gonna channel your <laughs> your illegitimate father right now and I'm gonna tell you it's <laughs> negative five fucking stars. It was so it, it was not good. Because even like the explosions on the triple hell kind of diffused it for me, no pun intended, but it's like they were out of the way of everything they did. Like Okay, who's that hurting? Are you? It's like, are there, is there the impact of the explosion that's hurting you? Because it damn sure ain't the flames. Right, right. <laughs> and so then you've got this fucking cheesy ass, yeah, like fucking ninety-five diesel entrance that like halfway malfunctioned right. <laughs> as, as your as your closing moment <laughs> to this death match. Ah, like right. it sucks because so much of this pay per view was good. Like objectively speaking, you had a great cinematic match. 
You yeah. had a really entertaining ladder match. The tag team battle royal was solid. The tag title match was good. The women's match was great. You had so much good stuff in the show. But people aren't going to remember that. They're going to remember this wet fart of an explosion right. to end the exploding death match. Oh, please, God. It's WCW Nitro! Uh <laughs> Okay, time for our grade for this. Um, man, I think that what happened at the very end of this show, I had to knock it down to, I don't want to say C+, because it makes it seem the rest of the show was bad. It wasn't. I'm going to give it a B-, minus because I think that explosion knocked it off like at least a grade. I I'm torn, man. I don't know if I want to do C+, plus or not, because it was so good. Like, what, what grade are you going to give it? I'm going to give it a C+, plus. absolutely. I don't, I, I, I mean, it was, it was, everything to me was very 3.5 out of 5 stars through the whole show, in my opinion, except the, the cinematic match. Yeah. And, and so... Cinematic match and the women's matches were the toppers for me, personally. And you know what? I'm going to go with you. I'm going to give it a C+, plus as well. Like, I think the ending of the show kind of, like, took a lot out of it for me. Yeah, um, yeah I was kind of going between B- and C+, plus this whole time. I think that, um, yeah, other matches were, were good and, you know, fine and everything, but nothing... And I think the, they handled the surprise of Christian very well. I think that was about as good a person as you're going to get who can still go, who has, like, some mileage left on them, who has a lot of unfinished business, who probably isn't as expensive as Brock Lesnar or CM Punk, uh, but can still deliver good matches and good promos. Um, I think that, yeah, overall C-plus for me, because that explosion at the end really took it out of me. The ring work was pretty damn good. There was only a couple sloppy issues, you know, yeah. throughout some of the matches. Only a couple but... of real, like, botches where I went, ooh, that's, ooh. Right. That's going to show up on Matthew's video next week. I'm still not <laughs> a huge fan of AEW's booking, but, you know, it is what it is, and, um, I mean, everybody came out and did their best, so, I mean, I, I, I would have to say the, the definite, you know, negatives of the show would have to be that some of the matches carry on. They have a lot of, you know, what are, they're called Young Bucks matches, a lot of false finishes, you know, and stuff. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I don't know. I mean, it just seems like everybody has to get their shit in. But that being said, pretty good pay-per-view to watch. It was fun. It was entertaining to see. Yeah, I think it was worth the money and everything, and I had a good time watching it. And I think even the explosion at the end, it was like so bad it was good. It was just like, you know, it's a, a good laugh to end the night. <laughs> Pretty much. Just what you need after you see these two men blow the hell out of each other. Right. Well, what did you folks think of Revolution tonight? Let us know in the comment section below. Uh, what did you think of everything pre-Big Explosion, post-Big Explosion? Want to get your thoughts on it. But for Jay Biggs, I'm Brian Zane, and we'll see you next time.